Coulter, who has 660,000 Twitter followers, was reacting to the frequent mentions of Israel made by participants in the second televised Republican debate held Wednesday at the Ronald Reagan Library. And by the way, the Ronald Reagan thing, I know that I'm going to step on some... I am so over Reagan, I can't take it anymore. What is this worship of Ronald Reagan? I, what is this worship of the man like he was God? Here we go again. Ronald Reagan, the greatest man in the history of the world. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. All right, he was a decent president. Frankly, he had a mixed record, incidentally, as president, for those of you who may remember. See, I remember things you don't remember. I wasn't working for the government at the time in a back office screwing people as a lawyer. I wasn't collecting a government check from Ronald Reagan's uh, administration. I'm kind of independent. Ronald Reagan f screwed over the American farmer like you can't imagine. He destroyed the small farm in America. You don't know that. I saw it happen. I saw small farmers committing suicide across America with some of Reagan's uh, policies. He was like Joseph Stalin to the small farmer. They treated them like kulaks. So what's the point of raising Ronald Reagan up to God's head? I don't get that. With the airplane and the worship and, that, and, that, and in the back, there's Nancy Reagan. All right, already. She's not Martha Washington. God bless her, man. It's like, there she is. Okay, what? The world's moved on. Most people don't know who Ronald Reagan was. And the airplane, it's a little over the top for me. And another thing I didn't like is every three minutes, the applause. I turned it off a few times. What a dumb country this is. Can't we just have a question and answer without morons clapping? What do you need an audience for? Why do you need a live audience of stooges like seals slapping their hands together? And why didn't they ask questions of all of the contestants of the contest, the, the popularity contest? Why didn't they ask them about Hillary Clinton's failures and, and Barack Obama's failures? Wouldn't you think that's what a reasonable moderator would ask an opposition party instead of trying to nail them to a cross? Yeah, well, you know, 30 pieces of silver and all that. Everybody at CNN basically are the equivalent of those who know when I say 30 pieces of silver. Jake Tapper is Pontius Pilate, and the rest are no different. They would destroy America for 30 pieces of silver, but they didn't get anywhere last night. Anyway, look, we're running short of time. I'll be with you for another couple of hours. Be here or be nowhere. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. You heard me. I made a statement earlier about 30 pieces of silver. And I said that the moderator whatever his name is, Jacob uh, Woodpecker. He has the brains of a woodpecker, by the way, uh, was the equivalent of Pontius Pilate. He really was not Judas. He wasn't Judas and he wasn't really Pontius Pilate. He didn't, didn't rise to that level. The Judas in that debate would be someone who tried to undermine Trump in accord with CNN, and there were probably a few of them. I would say uh, Lance Previous, whatever his name is. I don't know his name, that weasel who runs the RNC. Where'd they get that character from? He would be a Judas betraying Trump and the American, pe the American people. But what, what does the phrase 30 pieces of silver mean? It describes the price at which people sell out. In Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, it is echoed in the 30 rubles which the character Sonia earns for selling herself. In Shakespeare's play, Henry IV, Part Two, the mistress of Falstaff asks and says, And didst thou not kiss me and bid me fetch thee 30 shillings? So it really is used to accuse politicians and artists of selling out their principles or ideals. And that's why we should all send Barack Obama a 30 pieces of silver as our token of gratitude to China. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised.
And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. It was really painful. I, I have to say this. I couldn't go on the full three hours. I gave up after two and a half. What was really remarkable is the degree to which they avoided the major issues facing the American oh, people. Up, I believe. Get him off the show. Just play the schlemiel. We should have klezmer music for Bernie Sanders. Klezmer music is a sort of Eastern European Jewish music of the last century. Actually, earlier than that. And in Jewish folklore, Bernie Sanders exists. He would have been the village clown. Not so much like a guy who puts on a costume because there's something wrong with him. But everyone knows he's weak-minded. And they would have known him as the schlemiel or the schlemazel. Those are Jewish words for Bernie Sanders. They're not dirty words. He's a schlemiel or a schlemazel, which is the best that the Democrats can find, since Hillary Clinton is hiding behind her uh, server somewhere, whoever it is serving her up to us. It was not a debate. It was an act. And it got worse and worse as the hours went on. I tuned in in the beginning, then the clapping, I turned it off. Every two minutes a clap, my brain goes off. I hear clapping, my brain goes off. I have to turn it off, it's, it's, it's canned. What do they need an audience for? What kind of embarrassment is this country that we need an audience of stooges sitting there? That's number one. Then, then the second hour, they cut Trump out and Woody Woodpecker, what his name is, Jake Woodpecker, tried to undermine everybody one after the other to earn brownie points from uh, the Judases who run CNN. I wonder who the real Pontius Pilate is, though. That, that's the real question is. We know that the Judases run uh, CNN. But anyway, th that's just a th neither here nor there. I would have asked if I had been the moderator and certainly didn't apply for the position or would I get it. I would have asked the opposition party questions about the existing party. That would be a that would be a debate. In other words, you have all these gentlemen and one lady who are up there from another party who want to be president. We all know that the country is divided pretty strongly about what this man in the White House has done to this country. Make no mistake about it. He has his supporters but he has people who would like to see him in jail for what he has done and what he's about to do, such as registering as many illegal aliens as he can before the election in order to uh, warp the electoral process once again to make sure we get another illegitimate person in the White House. So there are a lot of people who hate Obama for what he's doing, not because of the color of his skin. And I would have, if it was a fair-minded debate, I would have asked all the members of this Republican Party, what they would do if they were president, such as <clears throat> if you became president, would you indict Obama for any crimes? And then they ask each of them to give 30 seconds of an answer. That's not an easy question, by the way. If you really want to undermine Republicans, ask them that question. They're not smart enough to even think that way, because no matter how they answer it, they're going to be called names. But I would ask them. Uh, would you indict Obama for any crimes if you became president and which crimes? And then what charges would you bring against Hillary Clinton if you become president? Next question will be, what are Hillary Clinton's greatest policy failures? Fiorina, we'll begin with you. Donald Trump, you're next. Which federal departments would you reduce in size or eliminate? We'll begin with you, Lindsey Graham. I don't know who he is. How would you defeat ISIS? Do you plan on holding Black Lives Matter and other racist groups like them accountable for their actions? How do you plan on making our military strong again after Obama has gutted it? Those are the questions that I would have asked. Instead, you had uh, Jake Woodpecker asking questions that you'd expect a Judas to ask. That's all. The whole debate was a, a debate. The whole show was a, a Judas job. So let's go on to the callers on the Savage Nation. It's hour number two, and it's post-debate conversation, which we could go on, I guess, right? A little bit. Pope Francis did it again now. Again, he attacked America. Days before a stop in Cuba on his way to the United States, the communist pope on Thursday told young people from both countries that government heads who failed to plant the seeds of future leadership are worthless dictators. Now, this is in a nation run by dictators. Oh, he's not in Cuba yet? The Pope on Thursday responded from the Vatican to questions from students in Habana and New York during a CNN and Espanol teleconference on his initiative, blah, blah, blah. 
Asked by a Cuban student about the example of his leadership, Francis said, I will tell you one thing, a good leader is one who is capable of bringing up other leaders. If a leader wants to lead, okay, whatever. What else did he say? Uh, okay, nothing there. He's arriving soon. Think about that. A Catholic church was basically thrown out of Cuba by the dictatorship. That's what communists do. And now the Vatican loves Cuba. That's because politically they're, they're brothers. That's all. It's a terrorist organization, Cuba. It's a police state. It's, it's an island, North Korea. It's North Korea with palm trees. Cuba is North Korea with palm trees. They get to play uh, backgammon and they drive 54 Buicks. And that's their idea of a, of a worker's paradise. Sounds like Berkeley, California, by the way. WBAP, Doug, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Dr. Savage, you struck a chord with me whenever you uh, spoke about Ronald Reagan and, and how people always put him up on a pedestal. I grew up in, matter of fact, Ronald Reagan signed my DD-214. And sorry to say that Barack Obama signed my son. The, the thing is about Reagan, people don't understand, he is the one that allowed the first four million of illegals to come into this country. He that is also correct. That is correct. He passed amnesty when he was president. That is right. The, the American farmer held the price of food at a, at, at a, at a good level. And, and the hierarchies did not want that. So they created a subsidy where they were paying farmers to sit out their land. They shut down dairy farmers so the industrial milk industry could take it over so they could control See, the I'm the only one who knows that because of, the, of all the talk show hosts, I live in the real world. I never took it. I did not work for the federal government for Ronald Reagan. I was not a, a, a sports jockey or a disc jockey during his administration. I live in the real world, and I remember seeing farmer after farmer commit suicide because of Reagan's uh, uh, agricultural policies. It's an obscure point, but it's an important point because I don't like deifying politicians of any kind, whether they be Democrats or Republicans, and I'm so fed up with this deification of Ronald Reagan. It's enough already. I agree. I drove the tractors for a farming company. I was not the I was just a simple paid by the day labor that drove the tractors and i watched these two young men that took over their family farm two brothers that split it in half and were doing each side and i watched them over a period of seven or eight years completely destroy that whole thing by sitting it out and collecting two hundred dollars an acre on cotton subsidies and just just letting the land go to nowhere they you see doug you understand these things it's falling on deaf ears to my audience it's so long ago but Reagan was so long ago, and I don't like putting politicians on a pedestal when their, you know, their history is a little mixed. It wasn't exactly all perfect. That was my whole point. Now, holding the debate in the Reagan Library unto itself was a little bit uncomfortable for me. Why would they choose that venue, by the way? What was the point? Why would CNN choose that venue, or was it the RNC who chose it? What was the point? I, I don't know. Okay, thank you for remembering that. I don't want to talk about subsidies. Here's a news break that's sad. Remember Donald Trump appeared the other day on the retired U.S. battleship Iowa with the three guns? Everyone remembers that, right? Take a guess what Obama did to them today. Two days later, the evil dictator in the White House, through his IRS goon squad, revoked the nonprofit status of the Iowa benefit organization that hosted and sold tickets to the speech by Donald Trump. So if you think the IRS has been cleaned up, you're mistaken. Let me repeat it if you missed it. The evil dictator in the White House punished the Iowa, nonprofit Iowa group, trying to keep this battleship from being turned into a scrap heap, and stole their nonprofit status because they invited Trump to give a speech aboard the USS Iowa. So if you think Obama is, has learned anything by the IRS scandal, you're mistaken. I just thought I would uh, give you a little update. Janice, uh, no, let's go to line one, WJR in Detroit. Tom, what's on your mind? Go ahead, please. I don't think Ann Coulter's comments offended Jews any more than Bobby Fisher's comments offended Jews, you know, in the last 10 years of Bobby's life. 
I think people look at that, that they know Ann Coulter. They certainly knew Bobby Fischer. And, you know, the comments that were made were made. You know, I don't, I don't think you can read a whole lot into that. Well, when she tweets, how many effing Jews do these people think there are in the United States? You don't think that's offensive to Jewish people? Well, I think if you, uh, you consider Ann Coulter and the comments that she's made over her lifetime, no, I, I don't think. I, 